thank you very much for attending. This is the fifth Connected Sociologies curriculum event on slavery, indenture and the plantation economy. Um, the Connected Sociologies curriculum project, if you're not familiar with it, is funded by the Sociological Review Foundation and provides open access resources designed to support students and teachers interested in uh, what people call decolonizing, I guess, school, college and university curricula. We now have four modules online, so check them out in the link that I put into the box. Um, the Making of the Modern World, which is what this session is kind of feeding into. Um, British citizenship, race and rights. The Colonial Global Economy and Police and Crime and Violence. We'll be announcing more modules as well in due course, so watch uh, this space. But back to this event, we aim to explore how the processes of the transatlantic slave trade and circuits of indenture were central to the establishment of the modern world. Despite the fact that these processes and resistance to these processes, importantly, um, are often ignored within contemporary accounts of how the modern world came to be. Um, so we're joined by three brilliant speakers who are each gonna have around 12 minutes um, to introduce some ideas before we move into a Q&A. Um, and then we'll end at around 3.30, 3.45, depending very much on how good the questions are. Um, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A box because it's a bit of a nightmare trying to manage the chat um, on the chairing, but we'll, we'll do what we can. Um, so to introduce the speakers in order in which they will appear on your screens, first we're gonna have Trevor Bernard. Trevor is a Wilberforce Professor of Slavery and Emancipation at the University of Hull and Director of the Wilberforce Institute. He is the author of 15 books 46 articles of 45 book chapters. So he's been very busy in his academic career, it seems. Um, and is the editor in chief of the Oxford Online Bibliography in Atlantic History. Um, among his principal and most recent publications are Jamaica in the Age of Revolution, The Plantation Machine, Atlantic Capitalism in French Saint Domingue and British Jamaica, and Planters, Merchants and Slaves, Plantation Societies in British America. There were also loads more um, that I couldn't really list because it would have taken too long, Trevor. Um, Trevor has taught at universities in Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and Jamaica, and has had fellowships at research institutes in Germany, Britain, France, Australia, and the United States. His historical specialism is the plantation societies and global context in the middle of the 18th century. Then we'll have Maria Del Pilar Caladin, who was born and lives in London. She is an associate fellow of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, working on the system of indenture in Guyana and its representation in literature. She is the co-author of We Mark Your Memory, the first international anthology on the system of indenture in the British Empire. Her life writing has been published in Wasafiri and Charlie Brinkhurst Cuff's anthology, Mother Country, Real Stories of the Wimrush Children, which was long listed for the Jalak Prize in 2019. Maria's next book, The Other Wimrush, is an edited collection of her life writings, no, not of her life writings, of writings generally, life writings generally, um, about the experience of Chinese and Indian Caribbean Wimrush era migrants to the UK. It'll be published in Pluto Press in June 2021. So again, look out for that. And then last, but by no means least, we've got Nadine Chambers, um, who's a PhD student with me at Birkbeck, whose research intervenes into the separation of black and indigenous struggle in the afterlife of an introduction through settler colonialism and enslavement. The aim of Nadine's dissertation is to contribute to the creation of ethical guidelines between racialized communities who are writing and thinking across time, space, and race. She hopes to make new ground through critical interventions in black Atlantic, Canadian, and Caribbean studies in dialogue with indigenous studies. Her PhD follows critical archival studies and critical race theory as an approach to record to, to records and legal documents found in the geography of the National Archives in Canada, Jamaica and the United Kingdom. She's also been an Eccles Centre British Library Fellow and is a member of the User Advisory Group for the National Archives and will always be a West Indies Federation dreamer. So if you're ready, Trevor, uh, I'm going to hand over to you. And again, just to reiterate, um, if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. That'd be much appreciated. Thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. I think that it's less that I'm um, busy, uh, but just that I'm quite old, I think is the main, main, main thing that you might want to say about my, my, um, my, my work. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be invited today and I'm very pleased to see uh, so many people here. I hope that they're still here after my 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, and um, I apologize in advance for my sort of rather prog rock um, hairdo, which is uh, one of the signs of, of, of getting near to lo lockdown. Um, so I'm going to talk about, it's got, it's got the global slave trade. I'm not going to talk much about the global slave trade today, but more about, about slavery. And this is very much a very quick overview uh, 
uh, of a variety of topics in relationship to slavery and enslavement, uh, which might be useful for uh, our more distinguished later speakers. Um, so I'll just hear, this is a, 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 some of the books that, uh, that, that, I, um, uh, that, that I've written. You can sort of see some of the things that they were mentioned beforehand. Um, and a photo of me with a decent haircut, uh, or at least I thought so at that time. Um, and, and these are some of the things that I'm doing, looking at. I guess I'm mostly interested in 17th and 18th century slavery, and particularly British slavery, but we'll do a little bit on what slavery is in general. Um, and just to talk, talk about what some of the things that, that we want to talk about today. So this is very much, as I said, a brief overview to mention that this is about slavery as a, a, a worldwide institution. Uh, with distinctive American characteristics, racially exclusive and closely connected to capitalist exploitation, which I think is what two of our, uh, our other two speakers are going to be talking about. It's an institution that linked empires together. So when we think about slavery, we do think of it as an Atlantic, uh, an, as an Atlantic institution in particular, uh, but it is something that, that is much bigger than that. Uh, most societies at most times have had slavery. It's only very recently, from 1978, when Mauritania um, finally outlawed slavery, uh, that slavery became illegal around the world. But of course, as we know, a large number of people, perhaps larger than in the period of the Atlantic slave trade, are in forms of coerced labor that might be considered slavery. So just to say that, it is something which we might say is something which is not unusual. Most societies have had slavery and slaves. What do we, how would we define it? Well, people have talked about it in a variety of ways. One, the Harvard Jamaican born uh, sociologist Orlando Patterson um, sees slavery as social death or natal alienation. Uh, by that he means that uh, to be a slave is someone who in terms of his, his or her relationship to society, is some, someone who is, has experienced a death or has experienced a removal from all the normal institutions, uh, the normal institutions that other people are usually part of. And therefore that connects uh, the, the enslaved person very much to the person who owns the slave. It is therefore a relationship of power and dominion. We must say it also, it's the sustained by violence. Uh, slavery and violence go together. It is, James Vaughan talks about it, the institutionalization of marginality. And we won't talk too much about modern slavery today, but, but the key point is to talk about when Timothy talk about slavery today and in the past, two things that I would keep, make you keep in mind is firstly, that slavery itself has a history. It varies over time and it varies by place considerably. And the second thing is that while it is a crime today, for much of history, say slavery has been a socially ordained institution, which is one reason why when Britain gave up, abolished slavery in 1838, it was forced or it chose uh, to compensate slave owners for their loss of property, something which when we think about today uh, seems outrageous, uh, but perhaps was one of the only ways in which slavery could have been abolished in that period, given that it was a legally instituted institution. It's something which also has provided uh, great wealth, particularly in the case of Britain. And here I have uh, two, two 19th century paintings uh, by James Hakewell, a sort of pro-slavery approach, you might say. So this is favorable towards slavery. Uh, firstly, of a great estate in Western Jamaica, Rose Hall. You can see a, a, a lady and a gentleman uh, riding up to a gate uh, which has been presided over by a, 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 a black person. And then, a, and, and then a, a, an obelisk, uh, to Thomas Hibbert, uh, the greatest slave trader in the 18th century Jamaica. This memorial is gone now, but that just shows how wealthy uh, he was. Some person who would have had as much money as perhaps a senior aristocrat in Britain, all that money through slave trade. I'll go through a couple of questions, but one of the things which I think is important to ask is why does the slavery uh, in 17th, 18th century British America, 19th century British America, why did it rely on African slaves? Why did Europeans uh, not become enslaved? After all, Europeans were very willing to execute, to execute uh, Europeans convicted of crimes. They had no particular uh, love of poor people. 
uh, it would be much cheaper and much easier to take poor people from Europe rather than to buy, buy slaves from Africa. And I think there are three things which we might take, uh, take into mind here. The first one is, as Nathan Huggins, the African-American historian from Harvard from a long time ago said, when he asked, we asked the question, why did Africans enslave other Africans? The first thing is that they did not see them as Africans. Uh, Africa, in some ways, is a Western concept uh, and placed on, on, on various many peoples in Africa, what we call Africa from the time. In other words, Africa had a market. Europeans went to Africa and then took those enslaved people to, to, Europe, uh, to, to, to America. In part, I think, as David Elders puts it, uh, because they saw Africans as outsiders rather than insiders, as people that people that things could be done to. And Seymour Drescher makes that the point that the enforcement costs of seizing poor whites would have made European slavery impossible. Which raises one of the big questions in regard to slavery, uh, which we still don't have a really good answer to because we don't have the information. Uh, and you can make a plausible arguments either way. Did slavery follow racism? or did racism follow slavery? Uh, my view, but that not everybody shares this, uh, is that the, ma the majority of the interpretations, the majority of the, of the, of the, of the, of, of the, of the evidence that we have about the subject suggests that Europeans had a good deal of racism towards Africans, uh, even before slavery existed, but that racism was developed and and, and, and strengthened uh, by the institution of slavery. And we've I put here a few things here about the ideas about uh, biblical foundations of racism, uh, the experience of Iberians, and the relative limited knowledge about Africa in the 17th century, but a knowledge that Africa itself was full of slaveholding peoples. And therefore, the justification could be that, 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 that taking these people across the Atlantic was just taking people who had already been in slavery, enslaved through just wars and those sorts of things. Here's a quote from uh, a Toledo Islamic historian, which I put in, in support of my contention. Uh, I won't read it out here, but you can see in, 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 the, in what he's saying, uh, some things which become uh, racial tropes about Europeans attitudes to Africans later on. And this happens before uh, slavery is really established. In England, which was which before became Britain, in England was a major slaveholding region in the 17th century. Uh, racism, it's hard to, 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 to really discover. We can think of Shakespeare, for example. One of his great heroes is Othello, which you might, a, a black Moor, who you might say, you might say that this is someone who has a, uh, a Shakespeare has a positive view of Africans. Uh, but also he thought of Africans in highly negative ways, grossly uncivil, treacherous, and thieving. Uh, and this is Aaron in Titus Andronicus, uh, who's portrayed in a highly negative fashion. So the overall evidence it seems to me is that there was a degree of racism which encouraged Europeans and the English to think of slavery as an unthinking decision. But there's ev the evidence is so small that you can make a plausible argument the other way around. I won't talk too much about this, but just to say that uh, slavery in the English speaking world is very, is, is both connects to slavery in larger ways, but also connects to slavery in individual ways. English slavery in the new world was different. And in part that's because of a particular situation of the small island of Barbados, uh, which was, had no Native Americans. So it was easy for the Europeans uh, who arrived there in the 1620s to chop down all the forests and to establish plantations. And it was a place where something new was developed, what we call the sweet sugar revolution, or what Richard Ligon called the sweet negotiation of sugar. One of the ironies of history is at the same time in the English Civil War, as English people around the world, think of the Putney debates, for example, were fighting uh, to establish liberty. Uh, Englishmen in another part of the world, in Barbados, establishing a particularly harsh system of labor based on gang labor, which is sort of working in, 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 in monotonous uh, regularity with large numbers of enslaved people working under a small number of supervisors with the supervisors being white uh, for the main part uh, and enslaved people being entirely black. It was something which worked very well. Barbados got very rich, planters became very rich, 
uh, because they produced something which people desired, which was sugar, which went from being a luxury product to an, a, to an ordinary commodity in this period. Slavery was very much based on work and very much based on European demand for the products that enslaved people were. From the start, however, enslaved people, Africans brought to Barbados and then to the rest of the Caribbean and the American, uh, the Northern colonies of America, um, resisted slavery. Barbados saw a lot of slave rebellions in the 17th century, uh, which were put down with maximum ferocity. And I'll just read out a quotation, which I think shows the linkages between slavery, capitalism, and Englishness uh, in ways that are interesting. The devil was in the Englishman, that he makes everything work. He makes the Negro work, the horse work, the wood work, the water work, and the wind work. That was something said by an enslaved man uh, just about before he was to be executed. Sometimes you only got the only way that enslaved people could really say what they really thought uh, is when they were facing um, death uh, and, and execution. There are many ways we can think about slavery, but what I would say, what, one of the things that's important is to remember that slavery was about work uh, and hard, arduous work as well, which was injurious to slave health, particularly if you worked in sugar, uh, as these slaves, uh, enslaved people are doing. It brought great wealth uh, into, into plantations, which as you can see here, were like factories in the field, uh, both industrial and agricultural at the same time. And here's a boiling house from early 19th century Antigua, which gives an idea of the industrial ways in which enslaved people worked. Having said that, enslaved people were not entirely just workers. They developed family links. Uh, they, they developed their own forms of dancing and, and music. Uh, their own cultural patterns. Here's uh, a scene of red set girls from Jamaica in the 1830s, etc. So slavery was very brutal, but it did involve uh, some forms of cultural vibrancy. And I think that leads to the sorts of what I think were misleading comments uh, made in the recent report on racial relations in Britain, uh, whereby enslaved people's culture was emphasized uh, as against the, the the difficulties and horror of slavery. I'd emphasize the latter, um, how, how hard it was for slaves in their working lives, uh, more than I would emphasize uh, how enslaved people rose above slavery uh, through their various cultural formations. And as mentioned, slaves, enslaved people uh, always resisted. They ran away in large numbers. Uh, they resisted slavery in a variety of ways uh, and all sorts of things like that. I won't talk much about anti-slavery, but just to remember that until the mid 18th century, very few people uh, thought that slavery was wrong. In the middle of the 18th century, for a variety of intellectual, religious, and political reasons, uh, people started to see slavery uh, as a sin, as something that God had to be get rid of. And while we can emphasize, I guess, just how bad slavery was and how responsible the English and then the British were for slavery, in places like the Caribbean. We also have to recognize uh, what happened in the middle 18th century when a, few, a small number and then a large number of ordinary and elite uh, Britons against huge opposition from people with vested interests in slavery started to think that slavery was so wrong that they agitated against it. Here we have, for example, a famous uh, porcelain print by um, Josiah Wedwidge, I'm not a man and a brother, of the kneeling slave. And we can think of, uh, say, the Premier League, how they've adopted that particular image uh, later on. Uh, finally, this is my, my final slide here, is that slavery led to, was abolished in the 19th century. In many ways, however, uh, much of the effects of slavery continued. Uh, certainly slavery did not end racism, did not end racial dis dis discrimination. Uh, it led to the plantations in the British West Indies and then in the United States after the Civil War um, being reduced into economic decline. Uh, but it also was something whereby enslaved people uh, did their own things, uh, continued to show their resistance to enslavement um, and showed at all times that they had a different vision of what slavery was uh, to that of their masters. So thank you very much. Oh, cheers, thank you very much for that, Trevor. Um, again, a reminder, if you've got questions, please do put them in the, in the Q&A box. I see there's some piling up already. Um, so yeah, Maria, over to you now. 
Thanks so much. So good afternoon, my name is Maria. Um, I'm the daughter of a Guyanese man who came to Britain in 1961 as part of the Windrush generation. And although my dad was born in the Caribbean, his own grandparents were born in India, arriving in what was then called British Guyana in the 1870s and the 1880s. So my dad's grandparents were part of a system called indenture, which lasted from 1834 to 1920 and which brought over 2 million men, women and children from India to other parts of the British Empire to work on sugar, rubber, tea and cocoa plantations. Apart from the Caribbean, indentured labourers were also sent in large numbers to Mauritius, Fiji, South Africa, Sri Lanka and Malaysia. In addition, the British government in India made agreements to provide indentured labourers to other colonial powers, meaning that French and Dutch colonies in the Caribbean were able to exploit the increasingly nebulous infrastructure of recruitment that the British operated in villages and cities across the Calcutta and Madras presidencies. Indentured labourers would typically agree to work for a period of five years and while the terms of their agreements and their length differed in each colony, the indenture would normally include provision for a return passage. This was forfeited by many who chose to re-indenture and receive a plot of land in lieu of a return passage. Accordingly, by far the majority of indentured labourers never returned to India and their descendants are part of what I refer to as the Indian indentured labour diaspora. Despite their geographical distance from each other, this diaspora shares food, songs and cultural expressions that are unique to their experience as an overseas Indian community created by the dual forces of empire and capitalism. One of the most important of these is the concept of Jahaji Bai, the brotherhood of the boat. What this meant is that friendships between immigrants who made the crossing from India to the countries to which they would be indentured became familial with bonds so close in many cases that children of Jahaji Bai would be prohibited from marrying each other. In the case of my dad's Caribbean community, I think it's worthwhile to think about how the spirit of Jahaji Bai continued in the second imperial migration or in their second imperial migration that this group made as part of the Windrush generation. During the process of researching a book I recently edited with Professor David Davidin about this generation, I came across many Windrush elders who had maintained lifelong friendships with those they had migrated to the UK with in the 1950s and 1960s. I refer to the history of indenture as a hidden history of the British Empire. And for me, one of the most important reasons that indenture is not spoken about as part of Britain's imperial history is that it sits uncomfortably with a preferred, represent preferred representation of the empire in which British involvement in abusive systems of force or coerced labor died with slavery. But even before slavery was officially abolished and in anticipation of its termination, planters in the Caribbean were already considering countries from where they might source alternative means of cheap labor. While indenture was not slavery, it's important that we view it in the context of the world of the 19th century plantocracy, who had inhabited a world where they assumed the right to the labor of enslaved Africans. This sense of entitlement defined the way they would treat the Indians on the sugar plantations. Focusing on Guyana, the colonial archives show evidence of a system subjected to repeated inquiries because of the plantocracy's determination to, to press the legal limits of indenture in, a, in an attempt to extract the maximum labor at the minimum cost. In 1836, John Gladstone, the father of the man who would later become the British Prime Minister, wrote a letter to a Calcutta firm who had recently supplied indentured labourers to plantations in Mauritius. Gladstone owned two plantations in Guyana in the wake of the end of the apprenticeship system. He wanted to know if it would be possible to engage Indian labourers on the same terms in the Caribbean. The letter that the firm wrote back to them is quoted often by historians and I think that one of the reasons why is that it encapsulates both the dehumanising language that was used to refer to Indians and which was a feature of the period of indenture. But it also shows the level of deception that was involved in the system. And I, I quote from the letter now, 
Within the last two years, upwards of 2,000 natives have been sent from this to the Mauritius by several parties here under contracts of engagement for five years. The contracts we believe are all of a similar nature and we enclose a copy of one under which we have sent 700 or 800 men to the Mauritius. We are not aware that any greater difficulty would present itself in sending men to the West Indies, the natives being perfectly ignorant of the place they agreed to go to or the length of the voyage they are undertaking. The hill tribes, known by the name of Dangas, are looked down upon by the more cunning natives of the plains, and they are always spoken of as more akin to the monkey than the man. They have no religion, no education, and in their present state, no wants beyond eating, drinking, and sleeping. While well, historical sources tell us that the lack of care that created the system of recruitment meant that people who were vulnerable and separated from their families were frequently preyed upon by recruiters. We know that many people left India confused about the terms of their contract or the distance of the place that they were traveling to. Famines caused, and in many cases exacerbated by colonial policy, left many with no other choice than to try their luck somewhere else. It's important to also acknowledge that sometimes indenture offered people, and perhaps more specifically here women, a possible route of escape. Thus, while surviving oral history recounts stories of deceptive recruiters, others show that people made active and informed decisions to leave India in order to escape family strife or change their personal circumstances. We know, for example, that people would re-indenture to different colonies. These migrants were frequently condemned by the plantocracy who feared their presence on plantations because of their extensive knowledge of their rights under the system of indenture and their awareness of the modes of redress that were open to them. There is no doubt that the reasons that people found themselves under indenture were diverse, but what is beyond question is that whatever motivated individual departures, once Indians arrived on the plantations, they were subject to an authority that demanded that they exist in semi-penal conditions. The indenture needed, for example, a pass to leave their individual estates and were subject to harsh labor laws that in the very worst examples saw heavily pregnant women or women who had recently miscarried imprisoned when they were unable to work. Once in Guyana, a trope that was used heavily throughout indenture and in particular by the Guyanese plantocracy who were keen to prevent any interventions by the British government to halt the importation of indentured labor was that of improvement Colonial authorities argued that the process of migration bettered Indians, and they spoke about Guyana itself as a place that offered equality of opportunity in a way that India could not. At a point where the system was under great scrutiny in the UK, the same point at which Lord John Russell famously referred to his unwillingness to sanction what he called a new system of slavery, Guyana's governor attempted to persuade the British government that indenture offered an opportunity to spread Christianity to the Indians away from the perceived influence of the motherland and the caste system. In this vein, the governor's colonial surgeon provided something of a star turn in the colony's campaign to maintain Indian indentured immigration, writing emotively in correspondence to the UK of the alleged response of some Indians to these proselytizing efforts. And I quote from his letter here. I would furthermore add that Jan Haya Singh told me that he, with 15 of his countrymen, previous to their admission to the colonial hospital, had visited the minister of their parish, who had read something to them out of a Bible book, which made the water run out of his eyes. A major obstacle in preventing fair treatment for the immigrants at court was the fact that the colonial elite magistrates, judges, and plantation owners were all known to each other, frequenting the same clubs and socializing at each other's houses. Magistrates traveling to plantations for trials would stay at the plantation owner's house and were beholden to them for hospitality. Under these circumstances, Indians fairly questioned how they could expect a proper hearing. While some colonies had a protector of immigrants in place, the powers assigned to such an authority could depend on the whims of the colony's governors, and many governors limited the powers of the protector. It's important to highlight the fact that the indenture did not passively experience the system, and the ways in which they chose to fight back ranged from individual to community acts of resistance. 
In Guyana, Fiji and Trinidad, aggressive and sexually exploitative overseers were frequently tackled physically by Indians on the plantations. Calculated uprisings on estates, generated by oppressive working conditions and changes to contractual agreements, saw the system punctured and one might even say disrupted by a series of significant inquiries. One area of research I'm particularly interested in is how far actions taken by Indians on the sugar plantations combined with the intervention of colonists to destabilize indenture. Looking in particular at the case of Guyana, a riot on a plantation in 1869 triggered a long letter from a district magistrate to the colonial secretary of state arguing that the abuses perpetrated against the indentured laborers on the plantations, coupled with the lack of access to an effective justice system, meant that this riot was merely an indication of a future filled with similar events. This letter and the charges the magistrate made ultimately launched a commission of inquiry that saw British officials and an observer from the anti-slavery um, society arrive in Guyana to investigate their substance. Wherever indenture operated, it did so with resistance from laborers, or whether this was through individual acts of feigning illness or even committing suicide, or collective acts of plantation uprisings. While the opposition of indenture has traditionally been represented as an idea that emanated outward from Indians in India, an important area of an important area of future research must be to consider how much the sustained resistance of laborers across the British Empire was itself an important factor in abolition. This resistance is not just restricted to laborers because by the end of the 19th century, descendants of indenture had begun to access education and the beginning of the 20th century in Guyana and Trinidad saw many professionally qualified Indians using the letters pages of the local newspapers to air their concerns about how Indians were being treated on the colony sugar estates. I want to end this lecture by suggesting that we can still encounter resistance to indenture in the pages of contemporary literature. And I'd argue that many works of literature, short stories, novels, and poems by descendants of indentured laborers function as a challenge to what I've previously referred to as a dehumanizing language that we encounter in archives and which marks colonial representations of Indians under the system. Many writers have chosen to combine fact and fiction to imagine the lives of their indentured ancestors, and they've used literature as a tool with which to explore their familial history. The writer Moses Nagamutu, a Guyanese of South Indian heritage, wrote a novel based on the fragments of his family's history that he knew, that he knew arguing that history needed to be recovered not only by scholarship, but also by acts of the imagination. In 2018, the first international anthology of writing by descendants of indentured laborers was published by the Commonwealth Writers. Many of the contributors to this book took inspiration from their own family histories, writing essays, poems, and short stories inspired by the oral histories of their parents and grandparents. Although I've referred to the history of indenture in the British Empire as a hidden history, I do want to stress the impressive work that's taking place globally much of it led by descendants of indentured laborers to explore, analyze and interrogate the system and its legacies. Concerted work by historians, literary scholars, musicologists and sociologists has contributed to the emergence of indentureship studies with 2021 seeing the publication of the first ever academic journal dedicated to the subject. This journal, as well as a new annual lecture in indentureship studies are two important steps in taking the hidden history of indenture in the British Empire out into the open. Cheers, Maria. Thank you very much for that. Um, so to Nadine, our final speaker, over to you. Hi, uh, greetings to everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, be uh, sharing a bit of a PowerPoint uh, and I'm just going to stick to the text because I really want to be uh, mindful of time. Uh, let me just see if I can pull this up. I think I should be all right. Hopefully, hopefully, and I hope we'll share um, politely. All right. Um, let's, let's begin here. Let's see now. All right. So uh, I wanted to open uh, 
by just saying, uh, I've been to hundreds of Zooms, it feels like at this point. And I want to just really recognize that we're all sitting in some really uncertain times. Um, the BBC Business just uh, posted an article about the right to food and I thought, yeah, you're telling me. Um, and that said, there's a station I passed through during pre-pandemic times, which has a three billion pound chain outlet. And there's a person there whose job is to catch shoplifters. I recognize this guy and I've li linked eyes with them a couple of times and I know they don't enjoy their job and they're also quite good at it. And I imagine the stories that they're dealing with right now in this pandemic. And I generally hope that they do get to do referrals to food banks and, and uh, instead of calling the cops. Because remember, this is a three billion pound uh, food outlet. I say this um, because I know there's students in the audience and I see this and some of them are, are, are students that I have worked with um, previously in my previous life. And I say this because right now, years ago, um, would be the time to start cooking in the University Women's Center that I stewarded. And we, um, the students who are in the audience sitting with us right now, um, especially first generation folks and non-traditional folks have found themselves working on a degree right now, unsure of what a post-pandemic world looks like. And I just wanna say that I know you're out there. I know that you're holding on and worried sick. I'm probably telling people, you know, I'm okay. Um, but the job right now, I think, is to hang on to, you know, whatever life boys you have and try not to kick anyone while we're treading water, trying to keep afloat. And if you had the strength to make it here to this Zoom talk, I just ask you to reach out to a person that you know is out there that you may not have heard from in a while. Just reach, okay? Let's pull through this. Um, I just couldn't start this talk without saying that. And uh, I wanna thank Connected Sociologies and Amit for the invitation and my family, especially but not restricted to my aunt, Judy King Coleman, and my aunt who is in the audience, Beverly King Townsend for sharing pictures and stories with me, which you'll see in this presentation. I want to thank Philip Abram and Phil Hatfield who worked with me as a fellow at the Eccles Center and were lights at a very ugly time for me as a new PhD scholar. They were wonderful. I want to thank Sylvia Pasoko and Sarah Keenan, my excellent supervisors. And I wanna thank my household that I live in that hooks up with my space time traveling, which means I forget to cook, cook late dinners or burn the pot, but let's give thanks for food and good neighbors to share with what you got making it through these times. I wanna acknowledge that in the room sitting with you, although it's a webinar and you can't see, I have the privilege of seeing and uh, Guyana is in the room and Trinidad is in the room and you know parts of Jamaica and the Caribbean, this great federation uh, are in the room and many beloveds of mine who I never name directly mostly. So you, they know who they are, the Sweet Blade, Light War, The Lion, The Black Powder Crew, Vidya, Kelly, The Right Hand, Kathleen, CB, Angel Blaze, Sweet Tears, Andrew, The Matadora, The Grandmother's Own, The Chai, The Hal, and you know, people that I've met through the work of leading routes for black scholars here in the UK. I'm dedicating this talk to my aunt Joyce, my grand aunt, the eight, eldest matriarch whose birthday was yesterday and I give thanks for her and her cherry tree over there in Leighton Stone that fed many people. I also wanna acknowledge that much of my work has been done in the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, um, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh uh, in what's known as Vancouver. I wanna talk a little bit today about the power of food and community that was born in this introduction within the Bagua, which is the Taino word for the Caribbean Sea. And I wanna talk about what I call within my work in academia, and I will refer to these ways of knowing and unknowing. Maria spoke about these hidden histories of what I call the afterlife of an introduction by white colonial disciplinarity. And it becomes a distortion through which we see one another an indenture and enslavement, but I'll speak about indenture for a minute, is the way in which the British plan to cheat the formerly enslaved of just wages with people that they had intentionally displaced. And Maria has spoken quite eloquently about uh, those routes into the Caribbean. So I'm made up of those two stories. Um, my family's indenture date is lost in time so far but you will see pictures of my family um, in it. So these stories here um, that 
Trevor touched on and Maria touched on matter to me within my in my body and in my in my blood. And I wanted to just uh, speak to Elsa Govaya, who said it best, our eminent Guyanese historian, uh, wish she had lived longer. She said, unless we make a choice between the conflicting elements of which society is composed of at present, between the inferiority superiority ranking according to race and wealth, until we have made up our minds about that particular choice, we are not going to be able to be sufficiently sure of ourselves, of our own identity, to produce art or writing or any of the other creative forms of activity included, the activity of teaching both in schools and the universities. And until we have made this choice, Basically, we're not gonna be able to be creative because our energies are gonna be absorbed by the terrible work of work, job of working from two completely different sets of premises. The inferiority superior premise on one hand and the idea of one person, I'm um, riffing here, one vote. And the problem is one of urgency. And so hidden, uh, I'm gonna go through, through three spots. A uh, piece that I've worked on around the hidden relationship between Black and Indigenous people, which is in fact part of our journey from Tahiti, um, which shows up in um, the story of how breadfruit came to the Caribbean. And uh, in this story, Uru, which is breadfruit, and Aya, which are rose apples or OTT apple, um, depending on what part of the Caribbean you're from, uh, you know, introduces us to a person called Paupo, who was a, a, a stowaway on um, Captain Bly's ship. And he makes it to Jamaica. And he there is neither a slave nor free, white, nor quite indenture. And this is in 1793, where the plantation economy was in trouble. And Ducey Powell, Delcy Powell, uh, one of our, our uh, master botanists, spoke of this in an extract um, uh, and in her writing, give an extract from the known planter Brian Edwards of the 15,000 deaths of Black people at the time trapped between the violence of enslavement and environmental catastrophes. This number we firmly believe, um, Brian Edwards said, to perish of famine is 15,000 deaths again, or the diseases contracted by scanty or unwholesome diet between the later end of 18, 1780 and the beginning of 1787. And this key excerpt shows how um, the bedrock of the introduction of breadfruit to Jamaica and the Caribbean was part of the British Global Imperial Project. And that breadfruit's sole purpose was to sustain the, the life of Black people solely for the reaping of profit for slavery from slavery. And the last time I did a talk, someone asked if we should forget about the works of Edwards and Long. It's a pernicious question, really, um, since Black and Indigenous and Asian people continue to be trapped in colonial accounts. There, you know, though, as Jennifer Morgan recently said, sometimes we're only given one line, sometimes. And while I myself am using that one line when I find it as a stick of dynamite to make room for the things that have gone unnoticed by the many non-Caribbean, non-racialized historians that have written, but not because they don't have the psychic coordinates of our place in the Caribbean, don't know how to read the record necessarily. And so I'm interested in the introduction between people um, and thinking through on, um, and my writing, I'll, I'll put the link in, um, how breadfruit um, brought by Tahitians to Jamaica uh, actually lives within the Jamaican sense of food. When we say food, we don't mean just anything. We mean ground provisions. We mean yam, cocoa, dasheen, those things that those formerly enslaved folks refused to give up. And we have placed breadfruit beside that pantheon of, of treasured sustenance that we held on to. And this is where another part of indigenous life on the globe lives in the Caribbean, right next to pepper pot soup, right next to cassava and other, other things that Carib and Taino people who still exist in the Caribbean are, are part of our conversation. And so for me, um, uh, my talk is entitled In Radical Tr Friendship We Trust and All Others Pay Cash. And my grandparents' store is where I wanted to begin because they gave me some really amazing lessons that I will never give up. I will never abandon them. I will die by these particular laws. And this was a store that they built in Jonestown in Jamaica. And as my aunt said, and I quote, um, my grandfather, 
started out on his bicycle before he opened the store as a six foot by 12 foot by 14 foot structure. And that was the first physical like building. And he extended that single story building at the front and the small store became a hardware store. And he added a full corner and then the second story and the upstairs was for rentals. And at the side of that hardware store towards a corner, my grandparents rented that space to an Asian man uh, by the name of Willie who had a small Chinese grocery. I really want to talk about this, um, Maria touched on it because for me, there are some very significant anti-Chinese riots that happened in Jamaica. Uh, 1918, my grandparents were born, born 1913, 1915. So 1918, uh, 1938, and 1965, actually. So the shape of their childhood through to their adulthood was shaped by anti-Chinese riots. For me, born of these tensions of how the British set us up in a particular introduction to one another around indenture. But I wanted to say that, you know, that said, um, we don't remember quite when my grandparents' store started or haven't been shared that story yet. It's there. I'm just also not sharing it um, at this time, these slow stories that you have as family. And the ad for, but there is an ad that I have here, West Indies Furnishing Company, which is actually my grandfather's best friend's company, um, which I found in my bauxite uh, work by chance. This is an ad, and this is from 1952. So I know... And I know that my Uncle Mac, who was a light-skinned black man, almost passed for white, got a loan and helped my grandfather, who was a darker-skinned man, get a loan through that. And this is that business of how do you move together through a capitalist in economy and what do you do with it? What is possible to lift others while you climb? And it's a dignity that my grandparents um, extended to people um, through that store. Um, there's two things. Uh, one, in the early years, and I suspect beyond, they did not put people's names in a book when they trusted them with credit. What, that, what does that mean? It means for what people who could not read and write, you are not in a book somewhere where you put your ex. My grandparents would give you that item and trust that you would pay it off over time. And when you said you had finished paying for it, they believed you. These are principles that are possible within a capitalist society and were possible in a post plantation in the aftermath that my grandparents built a life out of nothing. And I added here the, this ad around uh, uniforms for central branch staff. It's actually for children. All of my aunts and uncles and my mother went to central branch. And I found this piece, you know, this is the, the thing where it talks about the teachers pretending that um, not pretending, but saying that children weren't dealing with poverty. The reason why they didn't have uniforms is out of a lack of self-respect. But I remember my grandparents' stories, which was people telling them, thank you. It, you know, for me, it was terrible. You'd be going somewhere and it, somebody would be talking to them. Uh, you know, for me, I need to get somewhere. But it was often people telling them, thank you for the credit they extended to them and the dignity that they expended to them. And these relationships, including... Things like uh, my grand, their relationship with Chinese shopkeepers, the magic of my grandmother's spice box, which I still have, which has Chinese spices in it, which wouldn't occur in any other household, I suspect, but was part of her relationship, which included going to Chinese community cooking schools and learning how to cook Chinese food because she had relationships with other shop, Chinese shopkeepers and, and relationships in that neighborhood. I can never repay these particular lessons. And uh, for me, there's nothing in this academic game that I'm in that will cleave me from these highest laws of, of sharing and care for one another through and beyond these introductions. I'm with my grandparents in this and I'm with Elsa Gabay in this. In terms of radical friendships, um, I would just say, um, you know, one of the things here, and this is pictures of my family. One of the things here, um, is, uh, and I'm going a little bit over time perhaps, but one of the things here is something I learned at a Health Beyond Prison Bars conference at uh, UBC, Musqueam Territory. An indigenous man who does visits to uh, incarcerated indigenous folks who are overrepresented in Canada said, one of the first questions he asked is, do I remind you of anyone that you know? 
And I've really carried that in my mind because I think that indenture and enslavement introduced us to one another in really pernicious ways. And I have to tell you, indenture's introductions um, have hurt me in many ways sometimes. Indenture from Kenya and Zimbabwe and Mauritius uh, has let me know that, you know, Black people were, were often not considered able to do things other than sweeping floors. I'll just put it to you that way. Uh, Caribbean indenture and Caribbean relationship has held me through those kinds of unpleasant introductions around how indenture showed up elsewhere and its relationship with the plantocracy and, and um, plantation um, politics and histories and the aftermath and the afterlife. And I just wanted to say um, really that um, I moved from uh, an organization where I had those kinds of brutal introductions to stewarding a space uh, at a university. And I would say, I took those instructions of my grandparents and Elsa to work with students of all genders, a new sense of self, new to activism, new to university, and kind of held on to what I learned in the Caribbean about welcome. And out of that radical welcome, I pretty much have these radical friendships that came out of it. Um, I've been given permission here to share these pictures. This is uh, Kelly, the right hand uh, with the pink hair, um, th who just can't even speak on the kinds of work um, that we did. But also Amir and Kathleen and Dion, whose particular histories represent Trinidad, Cuba, and Jamaica here. And I think about Kathleen as a granddaughter cooking for her grandmother and her joy of cooking stew peas for a grandmother. These are our conversations. This is Amir and Kathleen's wedding below. And my dream of the four of us traveling through Cuba, Jamaica and Trinidad to see what I know of as our Caribbean underneath the shadow of indenture and enslavement. Um, these are the stories. So not all of the stories in these pictures are necessarily working in cane fields. Radical welcome also comes from being at NYSA, the Native American um, uh, academic work um, uh, conference, where there was a workshop where uh, on Black and Indigenous relations, where a young woman got up and asked about where Asia fit in this. And I knew she was from home. She was actually Kuna, uh, Panamanian Indigenous, and her grandmother was Jamaican Chinese from Panama. And so, how the story of plantation economy abandoned shifts to the Panama Canal economy. And this is where I look forward to the work of my friend Arthia Smart on Carmelita, the trans sex worker creating needed and loved space while dreaming of life in Canada. This is where I think of Suzanne Prasad's Queer Indenture series on looking at how I think through queer indenture and black diasporic queer life can sit by side, side by side with my friend Vidya, who is in the audience here, beaming in from Guyana, the solidarities that we have through a digital life um, and digital meetings for one another through water and cane fields and a sense of family elders, poetry as prayers from the Southern continental route of the Caribbean in Guyana through to Jamaica, the Northern Ireland at the top one Caribbean. And so kind of in closing, I'd like to think about radicals scholarship, what would it mean to think on Windrush as a conduit of many forms of indenture? So what does it mean for Black Caribbean people to have come to England, supposedly to only work for a short time and then go back? What does it mean that the book, the boat, the Windrush meant to many places, including Nigeria, and did at least one transport to Belize, according to an acquaintance of mine, according, based on his aunt's journey? And what solidarities could be made if we understand indenture in Jamaica included picking up black folks, Africans from Sierra Leone, that there were indentured Africans as well, whose descendants reveal themselves to me in St. Thomas, and who allow our beloved National Dance Theater Company to make Kumina, the Congo sound and spirit, which they brought with them to those formerly enslaved to help us recover ourselves each and every time that Kumina is performed by Rex Nettleford and by the inheritors of that beautiful dream built in 1962. I can only hen end here to say that the dream of Elsa Gavaya mentioned by Dr. Matthew Smith in the Birkbeck screening of Island Rebels, Walter Rodney and Jamaica on Saturday, December 12th, 2020, 
was that as was that she hoped that we Caribbean people would write our histories, not as outsiders, as well-intentioned as they might feel. And that is, is even more critical as we see the erasures designed daily last week, of course, here in the UK. And that we that Black Caribbean people and Asian Caribbean people, Lebanese, Syrian Caribbean people can come together, indigenous Caribbean people. And I know my friend uh, is in the room here from Boricua from Puerto Rico, that we can sit and write together and be funded and nurtured to do this work that we should do freely anyway, in the spirit of honoring these journeys. And so, if, you know, my joy is in these radical friendships that I know, and I close just by the opening of this, that in radical friendships we trust and all others pay cash. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that, Nadine. That's really, that's really brilliant. Um, again, to everyone, if you have questions, put them in the box. They're piling up now. So I'm going to do my best to, um, to get to them. If the speakers as well could put your, could put your cameras on, that'd be cool, just so I have something to look at. Otherwise, I'm just looking into the abyss and I've no idea whether the questions are landing or whether they make no sense at all. Um, firstly, I've got two for, for you, Maria, just because there was um, two questions um, people asking if you could just name, could write the book name that you mentioned yeah, yeah. in the chat box. That'd be really yeah. good. Um, the other questions, there were two similar ones, but I thought I'd wrap them into one to ask you, um, Maria, was people, a couple of people just asked about where the information's available um, on indentured um, labourers in the Caribbean mm -hmm. in terms of like archives and stuff. And one question was basically on how those how those names are listed um, yeah. because they were saying that they're listed as just um, Hindu or Muslim in archives or yeah. in the census data. So how do you make sense, I guess, of the data? What's no, lost I, you in You know the data? what, I, I, sorry, sorry, I spoke over you, I apologise. Um, I, I saw that question. It's, it's actually really interesting because um, this is one of these examples where both the archives and oral histories work together So and literature. So, um, uh, in the archives, there are many letters that refer to the fact that um, Adivasi, um, Adivasi Indians who were called pejoratively by the British or referred pejoratively to the, by, the, the, by the British as, as hill coolies. So that's what that, that question is referring to. I, th I think the, um, the author of the question was saying, how can we know that they were part of indenture if they're not, if, if they're not recorded? As such and we only see uh, examples of people who were Hindus and Muslims. Well in the in the National Archives for example that there, there are a lot of correspondences that refer to the diminishing number of Adivasi people who were who were recruited and who were part of indenture from, um, uh, from India to the Caribbean uh, throughout indenture but always in diminishing numbers and the reasons that this was an issue is because they were although they were for a period favored by Caribbean planters there was also a competing industry colonial industry in uh, India that um, wanted them on tea and indigo plantations and that's why we I mean we know about it because it's a matter of colonial correspondence so it's it's there it's all kind of in the archives but also, I must say this, it's, it's really important because, I mean, I'm very interested in the way that literature contributes to our knowledge of history um, and indenture. If we take a book like Harold, the Trinidadian writer Harold Sonny Ledoux, um, his book No Pain Like This Body, Body refers to a place, again, this is another pejorative term, jungly, to refer to Adivasi Indians. Um, there's a place called Jangli Tola. And um, that village uh, was a village that was, is a village referred to, um, it's a fictional village um, that I believe was based on a real village. Um, and it was a community of Adivasi Indians who had started the village. Um, if you speak to descendants of indenture in Guyana, there is most certainly an awareness of, of people who have Adivasi heritage oh, they're aware of their own um you know they're aware of their own kind of grandparents great grandparents having come through the system and in fact one of my in-laws told me she referred to herself using that term um, using that colonial term and she was quite you know um she was quite sure and, and adamant that that was her heritage she was um from 
um, Adivasi parentage and 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 um, had come from a small community who had come to Guyana. So, in what I want to say is, these three sources can sometimes work together to give us a greater understanding of minority groups in indenture. Um, Nadine, as a as a keen archivist yourself, um, did you want to add anything on that? No, uh, I, I I think that's. Uh, you know, completely uh, brilliant. I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna add in terms of um, archival work, and I'm just looking at um, a particular question um, that's in in uh, from um, uh, Diamond. Uh, I, I do um, legal geography, so one of the the other ways in which um, I've looked at where indenture shows up, I, I'll, I'll give you. It's a, it's a kind of uh, slightly curious story. I was in the, um, as at UE Mona uh, in the, the law library, um, uh, the Norman Manley Law School Law Library, looking for something else. Um, and literally I was alone in the aisle and a, a blue book fell off of the shelf into the aisle. Now I can tell you, I walked around the back to see if somebody had pushed it. There was nobody in the aisle. The book just fell off and I thought, okay, this is one of those moments. I very carefully picked it up and looked at where it had, it had opened. And it opened to the first laws about indentured land ownership. How were indentured people legally allowed to get land, right? So how many years of service, how this kind of deal that had been offered as a promise, and of course we know that wasn't the case, had been listed in what's called the blue books, which are the, the law books of the time. And it was that moment when I knew my, my ancestors were reminding me, you know, daughter, we know you're, you're looking around and, you know, enslavement, et cetera, but you are not to forget us. And so there are many spaces, I leave it to Maria in that regard, but I would say that I look between the lines around those particular legal um, books um, to think that through. And I'm very aware of how, um, how uh, the laws shift and change accordingly. I mean, I, I live in, in British Columbia where there's huge South Asian uh, immigrants for building the railroad, et cetera. There are other ways and other formats of how South Asian folks have been moved across the world um, that don't necessarily sometimes have the I word attached to it, but are absolutely tied to those legacies. So I'll just kind of stop there. You know, it's gonna be a multi-person effort um, to share that and, and bring these stories forward. I'll stop there. No, thanks um, Nadine. While I'm, while I'm with you, there's been a couple of questions on some of the, for you, how did the shopkeeper get the name Willie? And what is Akuna someone put? And then someone else said, is Akuna and Coonley the same as Cooley? No, okay. Thank you. I'm really glad that was cleared up. So um, I, I, so there's two things, three things I got to clear up. <laughs> my aunt is, wants to remind me that my my aunt, my grand, my um, my grandfather's best friend was married to his sister, my grand aunt Hyacinth. That's one very important thing. Um, Willie was um, an individual um, who rented from my grandparents within that shop space, and I guess. What I'm trying to say is it, it, it breaks up um, very simple stories around, um, around uh, shopkeepers, who was a shopkeeper, who wasn't. Um, Easton Lee, um, who is one of our eminent um, 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 uh, his, historians, writers, authors, um, comes from that particular history. His dad um, was um, uh, immigrated to, from, from China to Jamaica and married a Jamaican woman who was not Chinese. And he talks about um, particular relationships where it was not adversarial and the difference between rural and, and, um, and, and urban. My grandparents were from an urban space. So I'm just brought that story forward to see that there are other relationships that, that, that occurred. Kuna, I, you know, in, that are hidden underneath kind of some of the accounts and I'm looking forward to Maria's book. Kuna is actually an indigenous community from the Panama region. So this individual was, and I can't remember her name, unfortunately, was advising that she was, her grandmother was Chinese Jamaican, but she was indigenous to Panama. Uh, a Kuna individual, that's a particular nation from there. 
Um, so no, I'm that I'm not using any other uh, relationship. I'm actually trying to signal that there are, are are Asian, Black, and Indigenous relationships within the Caribbean and, and the, the 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 region around the Caribbean, from Guyana, Belize, Florida, that we need to explore and be in conversation about. Thank you for your question. Cheers, Nadine. Um, Trevor, I know you've been uh, you've been in the in the darkness for a while. So I'll bring you back into the light with a couple of questions. The first one, someone said, um, do you have any recommendations for accessible books on, um, on the slave trade? As someone that has written many a book on the topic, I wondered if any of them were accessible um, and you'd recommend. Obviously we also have a session with Trevor coming out on the Connected Sociology website. So watch this space. But Trevor, that's a question to you. And then the second question was, um, also to you was one that one that's already been answered in the chat. I thought it'd be interesting um, to re-answer it uh, more broadly. And that was on the gender dynamics of enslavement. Like how important was gender to, to the processes that you've studied? Well, there are lots of, there are a number of books on the, on the slave trade. Um, what I, what I recommend, I think most of all would be uh, one of the, the great pioneering databases, which is the slave voyages database. Uh, which would give you a, a, a great a, a great example of this. This is under this is a, a website. You just look up slave slave trade voyages, and you'll find it. Uh, it's a website which 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 has been a pioneer uh, in this in establishing the exact numbers or close to exact numbers of enslaved people, or as close as we can get to it, uh, who who were transported across the Atlantic uh, from the mid fifteenth century to the mid nineteenth century. Um, and so, so it might seem dry, it's about numbers, but it's incredibly important. I'd also recommend uh, a book written by my colleague, David Richardson, um, and with David Altus, who were very important in the trade, Safe Trade database, uh, recommend a book which is on the, on the Atlas of Transatlantic Slavery. Uh, and if you want a quick, a quick survey, you might want to look at a book that I edited with Gad Human, who's the editor of Slavery and Abolition, uh, The Rutledge History of Slavery, which has uh, an essay on it on the slave trade uh, in there, which is a reasonably easy way of looking at it. Uh, gender is, 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 is incredibly important. Um, it's incre incredibly important in all fields of history uh, and life, but it's, 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 it's certainly shaped enslavement a, a great deal. Um, it, it, it was very important in terms, at least if we're looking at the at English slavery from the 17th, mid 17th century onwards, was very important in the origins of enslavement. Uh, Jennifer Morgan wrote a very interesting book called Laboring Women, uh, which talked about how one of the reasons why the English the English felt that slavery, the English had very few qualms about slavery, was because uh, African women. Uh, we use as laborers in the field in the ways that English women were not, uh, and so that made it quite different thing. And there were there certainly were uh, particular ways in which African women were sexualized in ways that made them seem as if they were ideal for work, uh, which 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 certainly was important in regard to how slavery was introduced. Uh, gender throughout was is always very significant in the plantation economy. One one of the things I think is, is often under recognised uh, is that it was women rather than men who were the majority of the workers in the plantation economy. Um, more men than women were relieved of going into the field, being made tradespeople, being made drivers. It was quite a patriarchal type of uh, the patriarchal society uh, in all respects and during during slavery. Uh, and it was women who, who tended to be majority of field workers. Working in sugar was extremely arduous and the sugar was the major crop uh, with which, which, which in the Caribbean, tobacco, rice, indigo, and later cotton in, in the American North. In the Caribbean, working in sugar uh, was so arduous to your health that it would, would have real problems in terms of reproduction and pregnancy, et cetera. Uh, which means that women had um, very significant problems, not only um, in, in life expectancy, but also in reproduction. So one of the things, of course, which makes a difference is that women are important in terms of reproduction, as well as in terms of production. And of course, one of the, um, one, one of the things which, which, was, which makes gender very important as well is that if, if, in terms of the relationships between uh, masters and mistresses and enslaved people, uh, 
uh, women face different types of pressures, but in particular, a, a large degree of sexual exploitation, uh, which was much less likely in the case of men. So gender, I think, is one of the things which shapes society uh, in, in, in enslaved societies, and it shapes it not only within the black population and the enslaved population, uh, but also within the freed population and within the white population. And a book that I'd recommend to you if you're interested in white women in the early Caribbean is by Christine Walker called Jamaica Ladies. Um, and I think that's a, a fascinating way whereby you can see um, how gender and race uh, merge in quite complicated ways. Cheers, Trevor. Um, Nadina Maria, did, did either of you want to come in thinking about the gender question in relation to indenture as well as um, uh, slavery? No? Okay, cool. Uh, All right, go yeah, very, very quickly. Um, I know that um, Suzanne Prasad's Queer Indenture, there's a really beautiful archive. I, I missed that talk. Um, uh, but there is a beautiful archive. I'm, I'm not sure if Bidia might have the link, he's um, is in the audience, might have the link to share. Um, and it's audio tape um, with um, South Asian folks in the Caribbean who are, are um, non-binary, uh, trans and uh, female identified um, that, that's um, linked there. Um, I'll, I'll, get, I'll send it to you, Ahmed, if, if, if Bidia can't post it right now, I apologize. It's, I missed that talk and it was quite brilliant. Trevor, thank you so much, Bidia. Straight from Guyana, blessings, my dear. Um, Trevor, thank you for raising uh, Jennifer Morgan. Um, she has a new book coming out I was just at the talk. Um, if you check my live tweets um, and live tweets, I live tweeted that event. And uh, she has a new book coming out um, um, that looks to be quite brilliant, um, talking about women, reproduction, and kinlessness and, and um, the ties there. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Cool, brilliant. Um, this is a question to all of you. Um, and it came up a couple of times. I'm gonna kind of try and wrap this into, into one coherent question. Um, which may not do the questions justice, but I'm doing my best. Um, and that's all we can ask for, isn't it? So um, what are the connections between enslaved and indentured labour, um, thinking about capitalism and neoliberalism today? And I'm going to ask that with another question, which I thought was really interesting. And is it that Trevor, in your talk, you mentioned um, slavery and illegality and legality, and Maria did as well, thinking about how plantation owners push the boundaries of legality. Um, and then I guess the question is kind of like, how can we understand kind of modern slavery as well as kind of like um, low skill, um, the that poor treatment of migrant labor today? Does that make sense? The wrapping of the two questions. I feel like they were linked, which is why I went and put them together. Trevor, do you want to come in first seeing as your microphone's off and then Maria? All right, well, I'll come in, I'll, I'll come in first. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I, I don't think I'd, I'd say anything particularly valuable about the links between historical slavery and capitalism today. But I would make the point is that historians have argued for a long time about whether uh, slavery was capitalist or not capitalist, and that particularly relates, I think, to the, the writings, if we're talking about sociology, to the writings of Marx, who, tended, who thought of slavery as a way station between feudalism and capitalism. I think most of us nowadays, particularly if we're looking at slavery in the Caribbean in the 17th and 18th century, which is my particular area, but slavery elsewhere in the Atlantic world, would say that in most ways it was a highly capitalist and a very modern institution. Uh, one of the great historians, uh, one of the great anthropologists, really, of of uh, uh, of of of, uh, of the West Indies, Sidney Mintz, uh, made that made that point in his work, which repeats very much in terms of C. L. R. James. C. L. R. James said uh, that he thought the, the the Caribbean slave lived the first modern life. And by that he meant also that he meant that they lived the first capitalist life in terms of, be, of the connections between them being units of labor uh, as much as being people. So there's a very strong capitalist area in, in that way. In terms of the links between uh, cap, uh, slavery, legality, uh, and modern slavery now, this is a much debated question and people have, have, st have strong opinions on either side. My, my tendency would be that, that slavery is a strong enough word and an emotive enough word that when we talk about the condition of people nowadays and use the word slavery to describe that condition, uh, that that's a suitable thing to do. And certainly the institute that I run uh, will talk about modern slavery following on from, from things such as in 
uh, Australia and particularly in Britain, the Modern Slavery Act that does all those sorts of things. Many people, however, um, and this would be something that say Orlando Patterson has, has, has put forward uh, as against Kevin Bales, who takes the, the opposite position, would say that there are real differences between historical slavery in regard to, to, in, in regard to the treatment of enslaved people and to modern slavery. And many people, many people who study modern slavery also would think that one of the problems we have is when we look at modern slavery, we immediately associate it in our mind uh, with transatlantic slavery, with American slavery, with, the, with, with slavery being very racially, de racially described, which is not really what modern slavery is. Modern slavery operates in all parts of the world with all sorts of people. Uh, and does have different types of relationship than under, under slavery. It does make a real difference, I think, however, that slavery is not legal anymore. Because one of the fundamental parts of slavery uh, is that an enslaved person can be bought or sold, can be, can be, be put in terms of in various types of legal positions. That's impossible now. You can't legally purchase or not purchase enslaved uh, people who are slaves, although Although, as a matter of fact, people are people are people are sold for money all the time. But it does make a difference that it's now a crime rather than what it was beforehand. Uh, and, and, and having said that, I'm, I, I realize I'm rambling on here for a little bit. But in having said that, I think one of the things that's very important uh, is that we do have a modern slave act, slavery act, which is a, a great thing. Uh, but it would be something which would be better if it was enforced more rigorously uh, and more people were prosecuted. Uh, under the Modern Slavery Act, and it would give real teeth uh, to something which uh, is not only a crime, but something which people consider one of the worst types of crimes. Cheers, Trevor. Uh, Nadine and Maria, do either of you want to come in? Oh. I, I should have said also, uh, just one thing, as I mentioned Sydney Mintz, uh, and we have mentioned Elsa Gavayat Bayer a couple of times, who was a uh, um, had not long had not long died after I arrived and uh, take up a job in Jamaica in the 1980s, and her presence was very palpable. She she was also very cons interested in that uh, generation of Caribbean and American historians, for the main part, uh, writing the 1950s, 60s, uh, 1950s and 60s in particular, about developing theories about the plantation economy which sees it very much as part of a capitalist institution and linking it uh, to various aspects of capitalism in the uh, what we then call the developing world in, the, in, the, in, 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 in that particular period. Uh, I, I, I did want to say a kind of um, uh, a point I was making to, I'm working at the moment on a book about um, descendants of um, indenture from Fiji uh, and collecting the oral histories of, of that community in the UK. And um, in the process of that, I was talking to a journalist of Indian Fijian heritage. And I was saying how kind of one of the frustrations of getting people to, to think about um, indenture is that people have, people forget about the, what was the, I think when, when um, I think when people, um, people don't make a connection between a product and the people who made it. Um, it's very difficult to get them to, to engage with the history. So people will see a packet of Demerara sugar without, you know, kind of really thinking about what, where the name Demerara comes from or the place or the, and um, my colleague said to me, um, you know, but people don't do that now. People don't make connections between the products they purchase and the people who make them now. Um, and and I, I, I think that that's, that's a really important point about how, you know, how that, you know, how that, that kind of that selective amnesia continues today. We don't like to think about, we don't think, like to think about the labor of, um, we don't like to think about the labor of the people involved. I remember asking my dad if he was aware growing up. So he was born in 1938 in Guyana, 100 years after the first indentured laborers arrived in Guyana. And I remember asking when he got old, you know, daddy, why didn't you like ask your grandparents about this or ask your grandparents about that? And he said, I, I totally wasn't interested. I want to go and watch the latest Western. 
in the cinema. I didn't want to think about how we were Indian or how Indian people came to the Caribbean. It wasn't until, you know, it was too late and I didn't have that opportunity to, to ask about those things or think about this. And, and, you know, to think that he grew up in an environment where the sugar estate was, uh, was everything. He was the only child who had, he was the only, so he, his dad was the only child of his family who, who didn't have to work on a sugar estate. Um, as the, so my dad is the son of the youngest child um, of, of an indentured labourer, um, which I mean, to me, to think about my dad is still alive now, he's in his 80s, that, that, is, that is quite the thing, isn't it? I, yeah, I, if I could take out from there, sorry, I didn't realize my mic was on. Absolutely, uh, you know, Mitch just made a comment um, in, in the audience here, you know, that there's a select, you know, there's an amnesia and there's pain. Like we know, you know, something that people don't remember is like the wind rush moving people from the Caribbean to England. Uh, the 1930s were rough. Those were some hard times, man. You know, you, Nor Basie Phillips talks about her grandmother, the cost, the, 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 the price of cocoa growing in, in Tobago being nothing, what it meant that things couldn't move between you know, the continent and the Caribbean because of the war. The, those 1930s were really heavy times. And I think sometimes they wanted to protect us also. You know what I mean? They, 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 or they didn't have words to say what happened. And, and that's a lot of what I run into when I'm, I'm, I'm trying to write through it. Sometimes our historians had to make a decision and they were like, do we talk about this, which could rip us apart further or do we like not? These are very, yeah, absolutely. You know, the recall of trauma, you know, these are really critical things. And as we see more people saying, oh, you know, just go into doing history. I'm like, are these supervisors for black students able and ready to deal with when young PhD students step up and start talking to community, because this is not just one person in a book. I There are times I go into the archive and I literally wrap my hair and put gloves on before literally touching certain things. It is very real and very palpable. I realize some people walk through ghosts. For me, not quite, you know? One of the things that I wanted to briefly see, um, somebody had brought up, New World Group with Gervan and Beckford and Carrie Levitt. Yes, indeed, these books live with me. The one thing that I will say, though, is that, you know, there's always this struggle, right, around enslavement, indenture. How do we put those histories together and talk about them? These are those divides through that introduction are, are very serious forces. And so sometimes in, 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 indigenous people as well, uh, Zinzi has asked a question around that. That's a, a much longer one accordingly. Um, but these, for me, I believe that people did the best that they could at the time. And it is for, as Maria is doing the work to go back in and to reclaim, to take the time to talk. Uh, persistent poverty and the critical tradition of Caribbean political economy, the legacy of, of G. Beck, George Beckford. Yeah, it is, but, but that sits beside books on indenture. How do we put those together and make a conversation um, that is more rich, that gets us through those particular battles and, and silences and twists and turns? And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Nadine. Um, I'm gonna try and... Sorry, Marie, do you want to come Wait, in? Can I, no, can I just pick up on what Nadine was saying there? Because it was so important to, um, to thinking about the Windrush generation who, who were, I mean, who we owe so much, um, children of Caribbean heritage here, here in the UK. And that is this, um, this point that you made, Nadine, about this desire pr to protect, how many stories they hid about the racism they experienced because they thought that we would not be able to prosper uh, or that those things would hold us back. And that's something I think about a lot now as I'm going through the process of creating an index for the other Windrush and, and um, you know, reading. There are a couple of academics, for example, whose parents were part of the Windrush generation have gone back to interview them. And that, you know, have kind of written for the book about how, how difficult that was for them to kind of make these connections themselves between their grandparents' experiences as indentured laborers and their own experiences as part of the Windrush generation. Maria, I'm gonna stick with you if that's all right for a second, because I've got like eight questions 
that I'm going to bring into one question that's going to encapsulate all of these all of these individual questions. So yeah, I'm glad you got a pen ready um, because it's about to go off. Um, so the first one is this is more of a general one from Sue Ming, and it's just like because um, obviously you, I mentioned the book that you're working on at the moment. Has have you got any accessible resources to recommend on Chinese indenture um, or relations between slavery, Indian indenture, and Chinese indenture? Um, so there is a phenomenal historian, Walton Lookly, who has written a beautiful book, um, uh, a, a, a beautiful book, a, a wonderful history. Um, and I'm just struggling. I wish I was upstairs because I have it on my I have it on my shelf. Um, but if you would just kindly, um, if I if I put the name in the chat, and uh, whoever asked, if you would just kindly kind of. Um, uh, Walton look like it's a giant book and it's such a beautifully researched um, history uh, there are more and if they come to me as we're speaking there are a significant amount more and, and as they come to me as as we're speaking I will put them in the chat I do also want to mention because we're speaking about the Windrush generation there are two writers of um, of, uh, of Chinese Guyanese heritage who are part of the Windrush generation and have written beautiful texts um, that make connections, important connections between um, indenture um, and um, and Windrush, and though the authors of those books are Jan Lo Shineborn and um, I'm going to tell you the second one. I'm going to tell you the second one as well. Uh, one of these books may be out of print, but I think it's still worth trying to find it. Um, so, I mean, I always come at this uh, from, from the, um, uh, you know, from the perspective of, of, of the archive and, uh, and literature. And I, I think that there is a really important amount of work. I would also, the book that I mentioned before, Hendry's Cure is a really important text um, that looks at relationships between uh, people of African Guyanese and people of Indian Guyanese uh, heritage during the, the 40s, 50s and 60s in Guyana. So I, I posted that earlier in the in the chat. All right. Well, that's one one question down. So we've got about six to go. So um, just for you, Maria, don't, Nadine, Trevor, you can put your feet up for a bit if you want. Um, so the, I, I'm going to lump these two together. Actually, these are quite similar. So the first one is how did the indentured people in places such as Trinidad relate to their neighbours? And I think that relates actually to another question, which is. Um, on kind of like the development of a racialized society in places like British Guyana and kind of, I guess, how colonial authorities set about a kind of population management and maybe the role of race and indenture okay. versus enslavement within that okay. relationship. Okay, I mean, there are far, 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 far greater minds than, than my humble one that have that have written and, and thought about this. I, I think perhaps the most important is uh, is, um, I mean, for, for me as a person of Guyanese heritage, obviously would be Walter Rodney, um, whose, whose book on um, the, um, whose book about the working people, the establishment of the working people um, of Guyana would be a very useful um, place to start. Um, I would not, um, I would not attempt to suggest um, I would not attempt to suggest to um, or um, to anyone that I was in any way equipped to discuss uh, um, any aspect of, of relationships between descendants of indenture and descendants of, of, of slavery in in Trinidad. I am not, and I, I so I will not I will not deal with that part of the question just out of respect for the for the many historians and scholars who are working um in um in a knowledgeable way to add uh, to add to that field of research nadine do you want to come in on that bit at all because i know you're interested in some of these connections and these linkages no i mean it's brilliant uh, larissa lies in the audience um you know she's been to jamaica in fact I, of, of many of my guests, she was the one folks are like, she can come back. <laughs> she, it, and, you know, doing her, um, uh, doing research on, on Chinese presence in, in, the, in the Caribbean as well. So uh, in terms of Hakka presence, um, and, and I'll, just, I'll just stop there. There are other, you know, there are other, you know, Maria's placed it, I've placed uh, one or two, uh, John Shinborn just did a reading, uh, her true, true name, which is an anthology of literature. She just did the reading for it. 
actually her niece was visiting here in Manchester. It was kind of wild. The world is very small. That's why you have to walk good. So I'll just say some, that work comes up in, in literature and I'll just stop there um, uh, and keep grabbing from the, some people have written to the panelists only instead of all attendance. So I'll just keep pulling from that and letting everybody catch what's there. I'll just, I'll just stop there. I think that was plenty. Yeah, cheers for that, Nadine. All right, Maria, last question, I promise now. I'm, 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 and, then I'll, and then I'll bring in Trevor and Nadine um, again. This is, just, this is quite an interesting one, I thought. Not that the other questions were not interesting, because I feel like saying that I'm suggesting that the other questions were not interesting, but they were. But this was, in this moment, interested me as I read it again. Um, are there any, is there any writing that you know of? Or I guess even in, when you've been speaking to people and collecting these oral histories, um, how often has like caste come up in terms of caste relations and indenture? And um, were those were those practices, sorry, finally, were those caste practices maintained within the indentured diaspora or were they kind of leveled out? Smoking hot um, potato, you've thrown me there. <laughs> um, okay, so what can I, there's so many, I mean, there's so many things to say about, uh, about caste, um, under in indenture and uh, I mean so I know scholars have referred to uh they've used <laughs> they've used the word charmerization to refer to a social leveling or equalization that occurred under indenture um but I do not think it is helpful to suggest uh that caste did not exist uh, or was erased under indenture that, that was not the case. Um, what I would invite people to uh, to think about, as I said, there's everything. To, there is there are so many things to say about it. I mean, beginning from the actual document of indenture itself, um, where many people were declared by recruiters and by um, by the colonial authorities to be caste that they were not, because obviously because agricultural castes were favoured under indenture. What I would encourage people to think about more helpfully is the fact of the sheer variety of people and their backgrounds who were part of the indenture system. So my colleague Tina Ramnarine has articulated one of, for me, one of the most important examples of why it is inappropriate and unhelpful for uh, for scholars who are not of indentured heritage to use the word coolie when they are referring to um, when they are referring to indentured laborers and what she what she says is that we are prevented from engaging with the diverse group of people that became indentured laborers um, artists musicians this idea that every was an agricultural laborer or had come from agri agricultural caste is deeply unhelpful and I think that any discussion that stops us from seeing people um, is is not is not helpful or interesting to me I, and I, I would really like a consideration of that history um, where we see who these people were and I the diversity of their of their economic, their social, and their cultural backgrounds. So, for example, in my own family, um, my one of my grandparents was from a minority South Indian community who were not favoured by the British plantocracy, um, because they were seen to be they were called uh, they were called again pejoratively madrasis uh, by the British. Um, and I, I, I am really interested in kind of bringing out these histories of groups who were minorities under indenture, Muslims, um, South Indians, Adivasis, to say, let us see the people, let us see the individuals, let us not see um, the labels, let's kind of um, see who they were, where they came from. Tina Ramnarine, um, for example, is a professor of music at Royal Holloway, has spoken about the amount of people who were learned in music um, and specifically she spoke about a college of music at a talk I saw her give a couple of years ago. So people who were at a college of music um, in very close to the recruitment depot who came as part of, um, as part of 
um, the cohort of indentured laborers in uh, for a number of years. And I, I got kind of that would be my response to the um, that would be my response to that question. It may be unsatisfactory, but it's still my response to the question. I hope it's not. But <laughs> no, no, thank you very much, Maria. That was honestly, I know I gave you like a, a barrage of um, of tough questions. So I apologize. Um, so finally, I'm going to ask one more question to Nadine. Then Trevor, I'm going to give you uh, 60 seconds to complete the topic um, for us. But Nadine, there was just, I only asked this because it was directed direct, it was directed directly at you. So I just thought I'd um, give you a chance to, and the person who asked it, the chance to hear what you thought. They said, firstly, they're very excited to hear about your work and where you might arrive. Um, and they're wondering how, um, as black British Caribbean people who have stories that our families are Taino in my case, or other indigenous people sit with and live through these stories. Um, they say they're curious about how you are trying to connect us as different peoples, but more how we hold, we are the same peoples. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's a really great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I, I Very quickly, um, on the February, March 26th, I was actually in a Zoom in Jamaica on a DNA project in the Caribbean currently. And I, I was deeply troubled by it. It's through Harvard. Um, I'm deeply troubled by it because um, as somebody that's lived in unceded territories in, in, in uh, North America, AKA Canada, it's been very made very clear by indigenous folks here that the idea of blood quantum, the idea of DNA does not speak in any way, shape or form in their relationship to, to one another or identity. This is extremely important. And so what was very interesting in, in that talk um, was folks who are clearly interested in DNA testing. And I have to say DNA testing is always nothing but trouble. <laughs> you know, I, in terms of, People finding out somehow that you you aren't related by blood to somebody who you've been related to for your entire life. Like I, I I'm not interested in those things. I'm not interested in those things in terms of analyzing uh, bodies or DNA as a form of uh, implying a relationship. So I think one of those things that's really important, and I think about this as well in terms of my own family, or you know, cur typical Caribbean history of mix up, mix up anyway, right? is that we have to move and proceed very carefully with those particular stories. I am writing about some of those pieces. It, it is dangerous and charged spaces. There's a lot of romanticism around it, which is why I stay very far away from ideas of people getting together and, you know, like making fat, like I, those are very, uh, those are very difficult. It's very easy to have a Hollywood version of it. I'm not saying they aren't possible, but I think we need to have care with those particular stories. Um, so yeah, those stories are coming up. You know, the Caribbean, you know, Trevor, you, you mentioned Barbados as being empty. Well, for me as somebody um, that comes out of, uh, you know, being in, in British Columbia, we know that sometimes indigenous folks had certain places as a hunting ground. They went there in the summer, you know, or they went there at certain points in time. When folks showed up and said it was empty, was it empty? Maybe it was part of a larger territory within an archipelago. And I'm not mad at you, Trevor, in that regard. I'm just saying that, you know, when in, in living in the Caribbean with this idea of extinction and, and, and gone, and then living in other indigenous communities where you realize, okay, actually there's not extinction completely in the Caribbean or gone. There are ways that we have to rethink these ideas of relationship to land, people, et cetera, and, 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 and genealogies, not in a DNA context. So I'll stop there. Thank you for the question. Cheers for that, Nadine. Um, yeah, those DNA tests are always a bit dodgy. I don't need to find out that I've got any more siblings. My dad's had enough kids. So it's one of those ones. You end up with an unwanted surprise. But um, Trevor, yep. I wanted to just... <laughs> Trevor, I wanted to just um, say to you, do, do you have any, any closing remarks? Um, someone also asked when you got interested in Jamaica. I don't know if you want to wrap that up in your closing remarks. I think it's Nadine's aunt, actually, so... Maybe you should. Oh. Maybe you should answer it. It's one of those ones. You've been put on the spot, Trevor. I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, that, that's that, that's fine. I'm I'm uh, my my origins are from I'm a, a New Zealander from the south of New Zealand. Um, no no direct uh, uh, no direct knowledge of uh, Jamaica at all. Although um, I was uh, all, all the Caribbean. Although 
I do remember being, um, as a, as a, as a, this shows my age, as a young boy, sort of obsessed by Gary Sobers and extremely disappointed. And I, on the one time I went to watch him and he went out for a duck uh, in, 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 in a cricket match, which I thought was very poor of him. Um, but, uh, but, but other than that, nothing, nothing very much of, of, of Jamaica um, until I went to graduate school in the 1980s. And I suppose got my first job in Jamaica uh, when I was 25 in 1987, I think it was, um, and uh, that that that's when I I realised that there was a very rich history uh, in Jamaica that was interesting. Um, I'd been interested in Jamaica a little bit before that, um, but I did think that, that this was a this was a fascinating a fascinating place, and with a lot more to be written about. And ever since then, I guess one of the things, and this is relates to Jamaica and how my my scholarship has has moved and towards the themes of of today's lecture. Um, it is something that, that I think that uh, for me, and I think for most historians, uh, many, a large number of historians over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, we've come to realize just uh, how important uh, slavery was in the making of the modern world, how diverse and different it was uh, in various places. And I think still one of the uh, biggest faults we have as historians of slavery, as we tend to think of it as timeless, as being the same in Barbados in the early 17th century, uh, as it is, as it was in Jamaica in the middle of the 18th century, as it was in Louisiana in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and I think that one of the things that we still need to do uh, is to think about slavery as being important both as both by space, it's different in various spaces, but also by time. It was very different being someone who was enslaved in a, in a period, as, as was the case for most people in the Caribbean, until the late, late, 19, late 18th century, uh, when the possibilities of emancipation were extremely small. Um, and it's very different for enslaved people in the 19th century, uh, when abolitionism made emancipation much more likely, uh, and the conditions of slavery to be somewhat different. And so that's one of the things that I think that I would, I, I would conclude is that I think that slavery is extremely important in the making of the modern world. Uh, and we have to pay attention to the differences that, 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 that are between different slave regimes. And in those slave regimes, the differences that that meant to people who were enslaved, who had a variety of different experiences and relationships uh, that we still need to work our way through. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, I'm going to do one last plug in the in the chat box. So the website with the resources. So Trevor and Maria have actually contributed to our Making of the Modern World um, uh, module. So please check out their sessions. They post some really good questions as well for people to think about. Um, we actually ran a short four-week course with six formers called Intro to the Making of the Modern World. I'm using some of these resources. Um, Maria's one was in it. And we maybe we'll do that next year more substantially. Um, so follow the Twitter, follow the Instagram. And I've been told that the YouTube channel is on 449 um, subscribers, which means if everyone in here presses the subscribe button, it will go all the way up to over 500, um, which would be good, um, I'm told. So aggressively um, plugging. Feel that aggressive plugging, please, and, and, and subscribe. Um, and also check out the relaunched Discover Society website. I also um, wanted to ask if any of the um, panelists would like to just put any links into the box, like please go for it. Um, anything about latest work or projects, that'd be great. I'm sure people would really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Like a, a virtual round of applause um, for all the speakers who were like really excellent and took time out of their day to um, drop the knowledge upon us all. So thank you very much. And then we'll just um, leave the chat going so you can subscribe to the YouTube and to all the relevant channels. Who knows, maybe one day next time we'll be on TikTok as well um, to kind of uh, bring, the, bring the resources to, to a wider population. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, finally, thanks again to Dean, Maria and Trevor. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amit.
Likewise. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, Amit, thank you for the invitation. Maria, your work, obviously. And uh, Trevor, yeah, thanks. For <laughs> uh, we, we should talk about, about New Zealand. There's some interesting uh, connections between uh, Jamaica and New Zealand. There's a little piece of history. And a, a Maori friend of mine was in the room. So uh, island solidarity. There's a thing about islands that, that's quite rich. So, you know, perhaps we speak again. Amit, thank you so much, and, and all of you, and everyone that showed up today, you know, big time. It's such a heavy time, but uh, really grateful. All right, I'll stop there. Cheers, Nadine. Maybe you could also bring, you and Trevor can bring a whole into this analysis, the triumvirate of whole, um, the Caribbean and New Zealand. I feel like there could be some rich research done there. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the reality is, is that after plantation, uh, folks moved money out of the Caribbean in, into the British Dominion. And so it went to Australia and New Zealand to set things up. So there, there are connections and other rich rebel ones too, but that's another talk. All right, I'm gonna turn my video off and thank you all so much. Thanks so much for me as well. It was really great. Take care, bye.